Hey everybody, Evan Savage here. I'm the pastor of Grassroots Church. Thank you for joining us uh, by watching our messages from this past week or maybe weeks before. We are glad that you're taking time out of your week to learn, to engage with our church from an online point of view. We would love for you to join us on Sunday mornings for tangible community worship and of course some messages as well. Uh, and if that interests you, you, we would love for you to join us at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Thank you again, and I hope that this message is edifying to your spirit. Fifteen. If your brother sins against you, go and rebuke him in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he won't listen, take one or two others with you, so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. If he doesn't pay attention to them, tell the church. If he doesn't pay attention even to the church, let him be like a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth, you have bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth, you will loose in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about any matter that you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them. Then Peter approached him and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? As many as seven times? I tell you, not even as many as seven, Jesus replied but 70 times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle accounts, one who owed 10,000 talents was brought before him. Since he did not have the money to pay it back, his master commanded that he, his wife, his children, and everything he had to be sold to pay the debt. At this, the servant fell face down before him and said, be patient with me and I will pay you everything. Then the master of that servant had compassion, released him, and forgave him the loan. That servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him, started choking him, and said, pay what you owe. At this, his fellow servant fell down and began begging him, be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he wasn't willing. Instead, he went and threw him into prison until he could pay what was owed. When the other servants saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed and went and reported to their master everything that had happened. Then after he had summoned him, his master said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And because he was angry, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed. So also my heavenly father will do to you unless every one of you forgives his brother or sister from your heart. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for our time together this morning. Um, Thank you that we can come together, we can sing, and we can uh, worship through song, and we can worship through just the reading of your word. We're thankful for the truth that is found in it. We're thankful that um, Jesus uh, teaches this um, about forgiveness, but then he goes on later in his, in his life and he uh, practices this forgiveness where he gives up his life and forgives us of all of our sins. We are grateful and thankful for the grace and the love that is found in Jesus. Uh, help us to explore this idea of forgiveness, and we ask that you would be patient with us as we try to forgive. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. So I wanna begin today just with a couple of statements regarding um, forgiveness. And um, number one is I don't wanna be insensitive toward um, anybody in here's past hurts, uh, current wrongs, personal struggles, uh, personal relationships that are affected by forgiveness, uh, the severity of, of what has happened to you, I don't want to be flippant toward those things because I know those things are very serious. Um, it would be adverse for me to come up here and just spout Bible verses at you for 30 minutes and just 
say, you better forgive, you better forgive, you better forgive, that's, that's counterintuitive, uh, and that would not be helpful. So um, forgiveness is hard. <laughs> and for some of us, it, it feels a lot years away than for others in here, depending on your situation. So I want to be sensitive uh, to, to the people in here who may be experiencing those, those types of feelings. Uh, the second thing is um, I am in no way approaching today's talk as someone who fully practices forgiveness. Um, I'm not the poster child. I'm not the Michael Jordan. I'm not the LeBron James of forgiveness. That's just not how I roll. I can, I can harbor some, some bitter feelings towards people. And in fact, I, I still am. And um, so I'm working through that. So... Um, just want to be transparent. Um, so with that, let's talk about forgiveness. Woo-hoo. So we want to cover three things. Uh, the first thing is, um, we'll notice when we kind of jump back into the parable, uh, that the basis of forgiveness is the gospel. The basis of forgiveness is Jesus Christ and his grace and his mercy, his compassion, his love. Um, the, the forgiving gospel. That's, that's point number one that we will talk about. Um, number two is that we're going to discover that there is also a process of forgiveness, which is very practical and very difficult. So we'll talk about that. That's the second thing. Number three is that uh, we want to tackle a little bit of unforgiveness and the problem with unforgiveness and what unforgiveness might be creating in us. Okay? Sound good? All right. Let's do it. So let's talk about the gospel. Let's go back to verse 21. Then Peter approached him and asked, Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? As many as seven times? I love that it's Peter asking that question. Mr. Loudmouth. Jesus says, now I tell you, not uh, as many as seven, Jesus replied, but 70 times Seven, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle accounts, one who owed 10,000 talents was brought before him. Since he did not have the money to pay it back, his master commanded that he, his wife, his children, and everything he had be sold to pay the debt. At this, the servant fell face down before him and said, be patient with me and I will pay you everything. Then the master of that servant had compassion, released him, and forgave him the loan. So the first thing we want to um, talk about is for- forgiveness. What is, what is it? How can we define it? So let's define it. And we could, we could really uh, probably deduce what forgiveness is from this parable. Forgiveness simply means to cancel or release someone from a debt. We see that in the parable. So it's not uh, subject to special terms of repayment. It is based purely upon an act of unselfish and sincere mercy and grace. We can see that from the king. The servant is not subject to pay off his ridiculous debt, and we'll detail just what that is here in a second. And forgiveness also has a context. And forgiveness is necessary, it is a necessary element in the context of relationships. It's necessary because we're human and we do really bad things to each other, right? We say things, we do things about one another that cross the line and that offend each other. You cannot have a healthy, open, and honest, and authentic relationship without forgiveness. For those of you who are married in here, can you have a healthy marriage without forgiveness? For those of you who are, have some brothers and sisters in this room, can you have a healthy relationship with your brother and sister without forgiveness? The answer is no. So that's why Jesus' teaching about it is so direct. Jesus knows that it is something to be practiced by his followers so that they can exemplify the gospel in an almost tangible way. So when we forgive one another, it is, a, it is a good, solid representation of the forgiveness that we experience in Jesus and in the gospel. 
And I love that Jesus, he doesn't put a limit on forgiveness because he knows that forgiveness is a process and it's difficult. So what he says is, oh, it's 70 times seven, or it's an unlimited amount. So every time you think about that person that may have offended you, you forgive them over and over and over and over again. You release them from that debt. So let's look at this parable now. So remember what a parable is. We just got talking about Matthew 13 uh, a few weeks ago. We know that parables, um, they reveal a deep truth, call us to repentance, and help us to, um, uh, they, they call us into closer fellowship with Jesus. Cause us to walk in a closer walk with Jesus. So one of the things that this parable is explicitly teaching is that the foundation of forgiveness is the gospel itself. As disciples of Jesus, we need to wrap our minds around the good news of Jesus. And I love this parable. It is a great, it is a great example. It is a great um, illustration of the gospel. So a king is settling accounts with one of his servants. The servant owes the king a lot of money. I'm talking a lot of money. Let's break down his debt. A talent back then was worth 6000 Denarii, which was about 20 years worth of wages. This guy owes 10,000 talents, which would equal out to 60 million denarii. So this guy was presented with a um, Dave Ramsey book, The Financial Piece, and lit that junk on fire. He's like, I don't need baby step two. See you later. Where's my 60 million denarii? So he goes on and he spends 60 million denarii. So if a year's worth of wages is right around 300 denarii, that means that this servant would have to work 200,000 years to pay off his debt. That's a lot of money. What is this guy spending his money on? Really, what? 4K TVs probably. It's just I need a whole castle's worth of 4K TVs. So when the king said that all of the servant stuff, including himself, his wife, his children, needed to be sold to pay the debt, the servant falls down and says, be patient with me, I'll pay you everything. Question, could he pay the king back everything? Not a chance. Not a chance. So what happens? The king had compassion. The king released him, and the king forgave him his loan. This is an aspect of the gospel that we need to grasp. We cannot do enough to pay off our debt of sin. We can't do enough. There's not enough times of helping old ladies cross the street. You can't give enough to charity. You can't do enough good to pay off your sins of hatred, hostility, rebellion, lust, envy, jealousy, all of that stuff. You can't do enough. Second thing is that sometimes we think that we need to pay off the debt, don't we? As followers of Jesus, sometimes we, we, we slip into these, these moments where we think, I, I, I just really need to, I really need to work my butt off. Maybe if I read my Bible three times today and I pray five times, that will put me in a position where God can finally forgive me. I finally earn back God's forgiveness. And simply put, you can't do enough good. But sometimes we think we need to. The third thing in the gospel is that God has mercy on us. God has mercy on us. On us. We are objects of mercy. We are released from our wrongs. We are completely forgiven. We are completely forgiven. The thing about the gospel that we need to be reminded of is that forgiveness is free to us. It is a gift. By his grace, his mercy, his love, his passion. F- forgiveness is free. But Jesus takes the debt, doesn't he? Just because we pay nothing does not mean the sin is not paid for. Jesus takes the debt of forgiveness by graciously and lovingly laying down his life 
for us, his sinless life for our sinful one, all of our sinful one. So if we want to understand forgiveness, first, we look to Jesus. We understand that the gospel is a gospel of forgiveness, and it's truly good news. So that was the basis of forgiveness, the gospel. Secondly, this is the fun practical part, the process of forgiveness. Verse 15, Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he won't listen, take one or two others with you, so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. If he doesn't pay attention to them, tell the church. If he doesn't pay attention even to the church, let him be like a Gentile and a tax collector to you. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth, you will have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. Again, I tr- I, again truly, I tell you, if two uh, of you on earth agree about any matter that you pay for, pray for, it will be done for you by the Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them. So here's the first thing. Forgiveness must involve honest, heartfelt conversation and communication. Forgiveness must involve honest, heartfelt conversation and communication. We can call this conflict. Yay, conflict. I, uh, I'm a flighter when it comes to conflict. I absolutely will run 100 miles an hour in the opposite direction when it comes down to a conflict. I absolutely hate it. Some people, they dig their heels in and they actually like the fight. They like the fight. But no matter what, we have to understand that forgiveness, it has to involve some type of conflict. But we, we, have, to, we have to understand this too. Just because we're called to forgive does not mean, it does not mean that we're called to be a doormat. We're not called to be a doormat. We see this in the parable. Uh, he goes, uh, uh, not in the parable, but, but in, this, in this teaching that Jesus says, you, you, you go and, and you tell your brother or sister their fault. It's actually a rebuke. So this conversation begins with an exposing of that other person's sin or fault that they have done to you. You're not a doormat. You are not a doormat. Jesus does not call you to be a doormat. If someone said or did something to you that offended your being and your person, then Jesus is telling you to go directly to that person and tell them about it. So you get a say when somebody treats you like absolute garbage. It doesn't make you a jerk. It just means that you want to be treated as an image bearer of God. And if that person listens, you've won your brother. So sometimes forgiveness does lead to restoration. Yay, forgiveness, success, leads to restoration. Sometimes, but it doesn't always lead to restoration. So um, forgiveness has to involve honest, heartfelt communication. Secondly, forgiveness involves community. Forgiveness involves community. This is good for both parties, the offended and the offender. It's good for the offended because it offers space, mediation, and protection. The last thing that you need to do as someone who has been sinned against is to put yourself in another situation where the offender can hurt you again, depending on the situation, of course. So depending on the circumstance, it's totally necessary to involve others in a serious conflict. So involving the community is also good for the offender because it calls them to repent in the presence of brothers and sisters and in the presence of Jesus himself. Self, Jesus says that, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there with you. So Jesus is along for the ride. So forgiveness involves community. It is for the good and the betterment of the community. Um, churches, uh, churches lose their effectiveness when there's divisiveness, divisions, factions, whatever synonym you want to throw in there for that. A healthy church is a forgiving church. 
and it involves the community. The third thing is this, forgiveness does not necessarily lead to reconciliation. So the first point, sometimes it does, but then this third point, sometimes it doesn't. And and we also need to understand that forgiveness is not always reconciliation. Forgiveness is unilateral, it's one way, it's personal. Reconciliation is bilateral, it's a two-way street. There are two different processes and one does not always lead to another. You could probably think about a scenario in your life where this is true. Forgiveness is the personal process of releasing someone from the sins done against you. And this from Steve Cornell talking about reconciliation. He says, differing from forgiveness, reconciliation is often conditioned on the attitude and actions of the offender. While its aim is restoration of a broken relationship, those who commit significant and repeated offenses must be willing to recognize that reconciliation is a process. If they're genuinely repentant, they will recognize and accept that, they, uh, that, that the harm that they have caused takes time to heal. So forgiveness does not always lead to reconciliation, but forgiveness is deeply personal, and it is something that we must do. The next two points come from other scriptures. The next one is actually from the end of the parable in verse 35. It says, So also my heavenly Father will do to you unless every one of you forgives his brother or sister from your heart. This is the next point. Forgiveness begins in your heart. Forgiveness is personal. And the heart is a very Christianese thing to say, isn't it? The heart, the heart. And I hope everybody knows what I'm talking about when we say it and when the scriptures use it. Here, the the heart is regarded as the seat of feeling. It's an impulse, affection, desire, the mind, the seat of thought and emotion. Heart has a similar meaning to soul, but often the heart has a focus on thinking and understanding. It's the very core of our being. So when Jesus says to forgive in your heart, he's saying that he wants the core of our being to hold nothing against that person. No matter how hard that is, Jesus is saying from your heart, when you think about that person, I do not want you to think ill of that person. And he wants us to think of them as he thinks of them. Do you understand? Jesus sees them as forgiven, so we must see them as forgiven. If God does not, in the gospel, define us by our sins and our past wrongs, why should we define each other by the sins that we commit to each other? We will not be able to forgive one another until we realize the depths of forgiveness of our own personal sins and that God attributes that to the person who has sinned against us. The last point about the process. So uh, we pray for forgiveness and we also pray for the offender. We pray for forgiveness, to be enabled to forgive, and we also pray for the offender. As Jesus taught us to pray, we pray this at the end of every time we're together on a Sunday. And hopefully you pray this throughout the week. Because when Jesus said pray like this, he meant pray this prayer. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. So Jesus wants us to pray for the ability to forgive over and over and over again. And Jesus expects us to pray for the person who has wronged us. In Matthew 5, 44, he says, What I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I will tell you that if you, if, you, if you pray for the person who has done the offending, somehow the Spirit works through that to soften your heart toward that person. Eventually, over time. It doesn't happen overnight. So we pray for the ability to forgive and we pray for the person who has offended us. Maybe the prayer sounds something like, Father, help them to experience your forgiveness and help me to forgive them as you have forgiven me and have forgiven 
them at the cross. So that was point number two, the process of forgiveness. Number three, we want to talk a little bit about the problem of unforgiveness because unforgiveness is a problem. Let's jump back, let's jump back into that parable in verse 28. That servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him, started choking him, and said, pay what you owe. At this, his fellow servant fell down and began begging him, be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he wasn't willing. Instead, he went and threw him into prison until he could pay what was owed. When the other servants saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed and went and reported their master everything that had happened. Then after he had summoned him, his master said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you have also had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And because he was angry, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed. So also my heavenly Father will do to you unless every one of you forgives his brother or sister from your heart. Here is the problem with unforgiveness. Number one, it creates bitterness and a desire for vengeance. That's a really bad place to be. That is a really bad place to be. When you want something bad to happen to somebody else, that is not good. That is not God's intent for you. Unforgiveness can create in us a desire to have evil happen to evil. We think it's justice, but it's just cold-hearted vengeance. Just cold-hearted vengeance. But we don't worry about vengeance because God said that he will handle the vengeance. What Jesus would intend us to do is pray for, feed, and provide them something to drink, right? He wants us to come overcome evil with good. Evil never conquers evil. Bitterness never conquers anything. Look at Romans 12, 19 through 20, 21. Friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for God's wrath, because it's written, vengeance belongs to me, I will repay says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in so doing, you will be heaping fiery coals on his head. Here's the key. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. Hebrews 12, 15 says, make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up, causing trouble and defiling many. Bitterness is something that, that spreads like a virus or an infection. If you continue to hang on to their bitterness, you will become defined by your bitterness. I think everybody knows somebody in here that's probably a bitter person. Yeah, back in 94, that guy, he did something bad to me, I'd written him off. He called me a goon, he's dead to me, since 94. You know, like, we all know somebody like that. They just cannot let it go. And it kind of, it defines who they are. It defines who who they are. Let God worry about the consequences. And then this leads, bitterness and vengeance leads to another thing. It's irrational. Unforgiveness is irrational. We see this in the parable. The wicked servant threw his fellow servant into prison until he could pay back what was owed. So the last time I checked, when you throw somebody into prison, they can't work off a debt. We have these types of reactions, right? These irrational reactions to when somebody wrongs us? We do. I do. I know. I love that in the parable, you know, we, we, we went through, documented, this, di this guy has to, to live like uh, 200,000 lifetimes to pay off his debt, and then he gets mad over um, like a, a year's, a, a half of a year's worth of debt. Just minuscule. And then it just causes this crazy reaction where he's literally choking the guy. You guys ever watch The Simpsons where Homer is like strangling Bart and his tongue comes out? Like, that's what I'm picturing here. It's like, ah! It's irrational. It leads to irrational things. You know this, I know this. You have experienced it, I've experienced the irrational tendencies. Here's the last thing about unforgiveness. And this is an important, this is a very important thing to understand. Unforgiveness operates from a foundation of performance. 
Unforgiveness operates from a foundation of performance. I will forgive them when they do this. I will forgive them when they do that. If they would just, if they would just, if they would just. Do you hear it? They need to work into my forgiveness. But that's not how this should work. That is, not, that is not a characteristic that is informed by the gospel. The gospel says, forgive as, as you have been forgiven. It is not if you would just. It is, I will forgive you because Jesus has forgiven me. And if Jesus has forgiven me of all of this stuff, I choose, even though it's going to be very difficult, to forgive you of what you have done to me. Another thing that we have to understand about unforgiveness is that if you are, if you are just living in unforgiveness and you refuse to forgive perpetually, just you have this heart of bitterness, this, this heart of anger that will not let anything go, I think you need to sit back and check yourself. I think you need to sit back and check and see if you have been wrecked by the gospel of grace. Because a heart that has experienced the mercy and the compassion and the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus on the cross will never leave you the same. So when unforgiveness seems like your only option, we look to Jesus. When unforgiveness seems like your only option, we look to the community to help us along. There is hope for our unforgiveness. There is hope for forgiveness. And church, let us forgive as we have been forgiven. Let us pray.